okay, this is it. This is the end. I'll post an announcement later and modify the calendar because we're not going to have class on Friday. Today, I will complete my analysis of select passages from chapters 24, 25, and 26 of The Prince. And of course, I'll be seeing you or at least several of you during the presentations that have been scheduled on Zoom. And if you haven't done so, I'll show you where you can do it. And otherwise, do share a link to uh, a recorded video of your presentation uploaded to some kind of cloud platform. I'll start with the announcement because as promised, <coughs> I've modified temporarily the status of all the videos for my classes this semester, including CLT 362. I've changed the status from unlisted, which make them not searchable and not visible on my channel to public. This way, if you click on that link, if you go to Andrea Fedi as you, you can not only find all of the videos in one place, but you can take advantage of the search feature in YouTube and let's say you're looking for videos where I analyze the prints because you want to review some of them, you can just put in prints and find all of the videos and then from there find a chapter, a particular chapter or a group of chapters you're interested in or you want to review the introduction to a film, etc., etc. Okay, so take advantage of this and then of course, later on, after the end of the semester, those videos will revert to unlisted. I had mentioned a few days ago a um, YouTuber who is a former mafia captain for two New York families, Michael Francis, and the interviews that he had with uh, Charles Palminteri, the author and one of the actors of A Bronx Tale. Actually, it's one interview split over at least four videos, four or five different videos. So it must be more than an hour altogether. If you're interested, since as I mentioned, they at some point discuss Machiavelli as well uh, as <coughs> the application of some Machiavellian ideas to the film, you can find the video in here. Part four is where they discuss some of that. And I found, simply by looking at related videos, I had not discovered that until yesterday, that Palminteri himself has a YouTube channel, a, a bit rudimentary, and, and the style is, is a bit rough. Um, but he also posted a video about Machiavelli and the Mafia. So, and it's not a long video. So just if you're curious, you can uh, do that. Okay. So, As I've done during the last part of Monday's class, I'll use the Kindle version of the textbook with the same uh, pagination to review passages that I have uh, highlighted. And as usual, those are the philosophical passages, right? We haven't spent a lot of time analyzing the historical examples with the exception of a few, Cesare Borgia, uh, etc. It goes without saying that it is clear, going back to the uh, chapter that we discussed at the end of Monday's class, chapter 23, that even though from a philosophical standpoint, 
Machiavelli seems to insist on the reliability of the use of force, still we have then to appreciate the fact as readers that when push comes to shovel, you find more details about the deployment of influence or the side of the use of force deterrence, for example, that has to do with influence than about conflict or about actual tactics to be used during any kind of direct confrontation and conflict. Clearly, Machiavelli's mind is more interested on, in, in this side of control, right? That's why, for example, he has these paragraphs about flatterers, about not being uh, shielded from the truth, but not allowing at the same time people to approach the leader in any direct way um, without due consideration for the respect that leaders should have. There it is. Still this problem with this app. Let me try and fix it. The following chapter, chapter 24, is entitled Why the Princes of Italy Have Lost Their Kingdom. Here, too, the title is a bit deceiving about the real focus of, the, uh, of this chapter, which is not particularly long, because right away in the first paragraph, Machiavelli talks about the new prince. And keep in mind that new prince, in this context, doesn't mean someone who's not already placed within a context of power, such as the member of some aristocratic or influential family or someone with already a political background. So a new leader, a new prince in this context means someone who will make as their goal the plan of unifying Italy and becoming new in that context, new for that political organization that doesn't exist since Italy at that time is politically fragmented into about a dozen major and minor states plus another dozen states that fall under the influence of powerful neighbors but enjoy a certain degree of independence. It will be only at the end of this chapter, in the, fi in the final paragraph, that Machiavelli will actually address the issue of the reasons why the princes of Italy have lost their kingdoms. And once again, he doesn't go, he won't go into many historical details. He'll just say that they practiced, essentially, the idea proposed here is that uh, these leaders practiced the wrong kind of leadership, fail to understand what control is about, rather than relying on their own skills, provided they have the right skills for the crisis they have to face, they relied on the support of others such as allies or the populace, and clearly they had to fail. So we can review this passage. The thing set forth above is, if observed prudently, of course Machiavelli has to refer to everything else he has written up until this point, right? Meaning, I shouldn't have, Machiavelli implies, to explain what's happening in Italy, because if you understood the previous chapters, then it should be abundantly clear to you why they failed. Make a new prince appear hereditary. 
where Machiavelli is using registry as a metaphor, right? And the registry prints, if you go back to chapter two, is someone who has a, a long history of control over a political and social context, and therefore, having that long history can easily rely on influence, right? Because the subjects, the citizens, haven't known everything else, they've become habituated to that government. And Machiavelli is saying, well, it is possible to produce that, which means it is possible to deploy a lot of influence without having to commit 20, 30 years or several generations to building up that kind of influence as it happened for signorie, for families, aristocratic or mercantile, wealthy families that established power, their power over a city-state or a small area of Italy between the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. So even in this case, Machiavelli favors the use of influence, only saying you don't need as much time as you might have thought. And they make him immediately more secure. So again, even though Machiavelli has emphasized the reliability of force, he's talking here about security to be gained from being seen as a true leader, more firm in his state as though he had grown old in it. For the deeds of a new prince are observed with much more interest. Notice the use of the verb observed. We are talking about the image projected by the prince, right? than those of a hereditary one. And in here you see the beginning of a pattern developing in these last three chapters where Machiavelli seems to favor something that is new, seems to imply that something that is new, whether completely right or wrong, carries some influence, garners attention, offers untapped opportunities. And therefore, in the end, acting, doing something, changing the status quo is seen in itself as something positive. So throughout the last three chapters, Machiavelli sometimes strays away from the strictly logical and pragmatic approach that he has displayed and used throughout most of the previous chapters. When they're recognized, again, observed, recognized, we're talking about the public image of the leader, to be virtuous. And notice the subtlety, recognized to be virtuous doesn't mean that they are entirely virtuous. That recognized virtue is part reality, right? There must be some real skills associated with leadership and part construction, because the leader has to work at building an image of values, honesty, that uh, would uh, gain the leader more influence, okay? So part of this is pretending. They grip men much more, grip men meaning they have this control through influence, and they obligate them much more than does ancient blood. Ancient blood meaning the succession from one leader to another within the same family that had been popular for not such a long period in some parts of Italy. Really, you don't find a lot of towns in Italy between the end of the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance where that happened. Or if it did, you see a few generations, you, you see three, four, five generations before some change occurred, especially at the end of the 15th century. By that time, the places where you have one family exercising control over the same place for a longer period of time are just a few. And Florence will become such a place, but only after Machiavelli's death, because it will be only in the 1530s that the Medicis will become officially dukes and grand dukes with hereditary rights, although those hereditary rights granted by the empire 
will be associated with the traditional Lex Salica, which uh, requires succession to happen uh, within the family from uh, the, 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 the male members, so the first male born of the family will inherit the title. If there are no uh, successors, one of the brothers might do the same, but women, according to that law, that feudal law that was applied to the aristocratic title conferred to the Medicis, did not extend to the women, so much so that at the beginning of the 18th century, the Medici family didn't have a male heir that could inherit the, tr the throne. They even resorted to the extreme measure of having a cardinal. And of course, it was not unusual for the third, the fourth son in an aristocratic family to enter the church instead of marrying or instead of trying a military career since they were excluded from succession. The church, uh, upon request from the family, granted license uh, and this cardinal left the church trying not to get the role, but more importantly, trying to generate an offspring, trying to impregnate a woman, uh, and, and it failed, of course. And the family lost control of Florence. And in the uh, uh, bizarre uh, domino game played by uh, diplomacy and uh, the aristocratic powers in Europe, a German family inherited the state of Florence and uh, controlled Florence until Florence was annexed to the Italian state, to the Italian kingdom between 1859 and 1860 with the uh, Risorgimento wars. Okay, but notice the use of the word obligate. Wasn't the case that obligation came with force, came with fear instead of influence? So is it contradiction or is it simply the overall approach, the intuition that influence is really the new element in this game and in this book altogether? Influence placed within the context of a complex set of rules, certainly, and and, and with lots of uh, specifications to be added. And what follows is again about influence, right? Because the passage that follows is about the psyche of the citizens. It's about the need to understand how the minds of the subjects work so that you can control their minds. For men, and by men it says most people, right? are taken with present things much more than with past ones. Meaning, if you solve this crisis, which is the present crisis for most of Italy, Italy having been invaded by foreign powers, being in disarray because the Italian states cannot form a coalition that is big enough or durable enough to uh, oppose uh, a powerful army to those invaders and repel them. Men are taken with present things much more than with past ones, and when they find good in present things, they enjoy there and look for nothing else. Which is a very pragmatic approach we would expect from Machiavelli. It doesn't matter who you are, what's your profile, whether you're truly honest, moral, whether you come from an established family or not, solve the issue and people will be bound to be bound to you be, be uh, supportive of your policies because they look at their present situation not at anything that is really outside of the context of the game um, Okay, here we are. Indeed, they will take up every defense for a prince, right? Which 
means, as we said other times, that influence leads to a collaborative, a cooperative game between the citizens and the government. That ultimately, yes, after talking so much about fear, the reliability of the use of force, it is still vital. It is still essential to have voluntary compliance from the citizens. If he is not lacking in the other things that pertain to himself, right? So you still need to have some true skills as well as a well-constructed public persona. In this way, he will have doubled his glory by having given a beginning to a principality, which would be the nation of Italy, and by having adorned it and strengthened it with good laws, that would be the second phase, right? You establish a new Italian nation, if not embracing all of Italy, at least with parts of central Italy and northern Italy, which was the strongest part economically. And then after you establish this, then you establish good laws. Then you establish firm boundaries from your citizens to habituate them to the new government and drive their compliance. So in here, you may have the deployment of fear because you need to uh, make sure that uh, the citizens are afraid of the consequences of any deviation from the law um, with good arms and good examples. Of course, we know good arms are both for uh, security, stability, for stability and order inside society and security outside. Just as a man has doubled his shame if, although born a prince, he has lost his principality through lack of prudence, which is an indirect criticism to the, the current leaders in Italy. And this, um, this reasoning is developed with some examples in the following paragraph, but we will skip and go to the next page where the criticism is detailed by Machiavelli <coughs> in, these, um, in, in this format, which is a very much a philosophical format. It's, it's not uh, in reference to specific events. These princes of ours, who were in their principalities for many years, so they should have had enough influence and time to prepare for a crisis, ought not to accuse fortune for having lost them. So Machiavelli will talk about fortune, especially in chapter 25th, uh, the next chapter, which is very famous. And in reference to that, he will say, well, you cannot blame fortune because both men and fortune are not in control. Neither is in control. Uh, uh, fortune cannot control all of what happens in any leader's life, and leaders cannot control everything that happens in the context where they operate. However, there is a fight, there is a dynamic interaction between fortune, meaning the circumstances, the change in circumstances in the context where you operate as a leader, there is a dynamic interaction between fortune and skills, whereby you constantly have to work at being prepared and work at adjusting to the changes as they occur. And in fact, you have to be able to read the signs. Remember how I said at the beginning of the semester that Machiavelli borrows the process of medicine and thinks of this process in terms of recognizing the symptoms right? Which seems easy, but both in medicine and in this kind of political thinking is much more difficult, right? Because not everything that happens in the body is a symptom, right? Not everything that you observe in the patient in front of you is a meaningful symptom that will help you diagnose the problem. Still, through analysis, Machiavelli suggests 
that the good leader has to recognize the signs the changes are coming and understand what the issue will be and apply the treatment in a timely fashion and everything is about being timely using the right treatment at the right time because after the sickness in this case the political crisis has expanded even the right therapy even the right treatment even the right strategy will not be successful at healing at producing uh, an outcome that is favorable. So you cannot choose fortune because basically Machiavelli is saying they haven't acted upon the signs that they should have identified as symptoms of a problem that was coming. And, and Machiavelli is perfectly correct in this, right? Because in, in a few words, the issue with Italy between 1494 and 1559, the period of these European wars, they're called Italian wars in history books, but it's Europe invading, the rest of Europe invading Italy, essentially Spain, France, the empire, which represents central and northern parts of Eastern Europe. During this period, it was clear what was going to happen because you have nation states becoming more and more powerful, Spain, France, and the German Empire, who, who's not really a nation state, but certainly has a lot of power just based on the number of people living within its territory, the resources they have, the strategic position they occupy. And then you have Italy, who that occupies such a central and strategic position within the Mediterranean, who, when this crisis begins, 1494, is still the central body of water for international traffic. Because yes, the um, new world has been discovered by Columbus in 1492, but it will take another 50 years, really, for explorations to be completed, for resources, material resources, to come from those colonies, from those areas, and the international balance to be changed whereby the Mediterranean loses, loses its centrality. But when this starts, when this series of problems has its inception, Italy occupies a strategic, a central position in a body of water that has the most lucrative traffics, commercial traffics, in the known world at that point, right? Because through the Mediterranean, you have the products, the material coming from Asia as far uh, uh, as Indonesia and, and, of course, China being transported to Italy, used in manufacturing, and used them for, for exports. Yet, this very strategic, very central from the economic as well as the military point of view, territory that is Italy is so fragmented, is not a nation state. So everyone can see they're flushed with cash. They have so much gold, silver, relics, works of art, any sorts of things that are valuable and they're weak. So clearly they had to become a target at some point. And once France starts with an invasion that is not really that successful, the first invasion is not successful, everyone else in Europe wakes up to this reality. Now, Italy is even weaker having suffered the first invasion. The first invasion has demonstrated that invading Italy is possible, even though after the success of the initial attack, the uh, uh, territorial control and the completion of the campaign was not uh, handled properly by the French for a variety of reasons, including the fact that they could rely <clears throat> on an army, but they couldn't use their fleet to support uh, their uh, army during this campaign. They had to send all the supplies all the way from France through the Italian peninsula, all the way to uh, southern Italy, and, and that is not proper uh, strategy, right? But the signs were there. Machiavelli is correct. 
the signs were there that something like that might happen. And the reason, the real reasons why no one uh, really addressed the issue are, are complex, but <clears throat> a simple reason, uh, the simplest reason one can mention in reference, for example, to Venice, which was a good candidate to the position of unifier of Italy. They had the resources, they had the political know-how, they were modern state organized in a modern way, they had the infrastructures. Why wouldn't they try to unify at least part of Italy and, and therefore create a, a territorial and political uh, state that was strong enough to withstand any invasion? Because they'd rather make money and focus their um, attention on the successful uh, traffics, commercial traffics they had with the Eastern Mediterranean area where they themselves were expanding, right? During the same period, Venice was uh, establishing bases, conquering islands in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? Trying to control Crete, Cyprus, trying to establish other bases to support their uh, traffics. So that was in the short term, much more rewarding in terms of economic growth than engaging in a military campaign within Italy and then having to face the difficult task of establishing the legitimacy of their government since Florentines or people from Milan or people from Turin and Genoa would have seen the Venetians as foreigners and would have treated the Venetians as foreigners, right? Because Political fragmentation was backed by cultural fragmentation. Really, someone from another state was seen as a stranger. Okay. They never, during quiet times, thought that the times could change. Adapting to change is one of the themes in these last three chapters, which is a common defect of man to not think of storms during a calm, right? You might say, why not think of a pandemic before the pandemic hits? And certainly there were signs from the first SARS viruses uh, to the H1, what was it, uh, the aviary flu, that a pandemic might happen. And almost every country in the world had a, some kind of committee with plans, but those plans were on paper, right? The, the resources were not allocated, uh, measures to intervene quickly, uh, were, were never devised, right? And we were all caught unprepared, right? If anything, we were less prepared. I, I'm familiar with the case of Italy uh, because of uh, the, the attempt to make the health system, the public health system more efficient, Italy lost two thirds of hospital beds between the 1990s and the 2020s. And then when COVID hit, there were enough bad in intensive care units, of course, because a lot of hospitals had been closed, simply. Then when adverse times did come, they decided to flee. So they decided to save themselves, not to defend themselves. Conflict, they did not enter into a conflict for fear of losing. And they hoped that their pe people's hope, is, of course, very tenuous, as a thing, you can rely on hope. Hope that their peoples, when they were disgusted with the insolence of the victors, insolence is a reference to the fact that, according to Machiavelli, an invading army has to offend, cause damages to the conquered territory, would call them back, right? Because we said they were there for many years, supposedly they had a lot of influence, right? So they thought, I can save myself for a better time, and then because I have this long-standing influence, they will call me back because they love me, they, they like me. But that is not the case, right? Because Machiavelli has tried to explain earlier that influence requires a constant commitment, and you have to work for a longer time on it, but you can lose almost all of it in one instant. Will Smith, anyone? And uh, call them back. This op option, when others do not exist, is a good one, 
right? If that's the only plan you have, of course. But it is surely bad to have abandoned the re other remedies on behalf of this one. For one should never collapse just because you believe someone will lift you back up. You, you cannot become a loser for fear of losing, right? You cannot abandon control for fear that someone will take it from you during a conflict. Either this does not happen, or if it happens, it is not to your safety, for such a defense was cowardly and it did not depend on you. So if it doesn't depend on you, you cannot control, right? According to the Machiavellian system, you have to rely on what you can control. You cannot control others. Yes, you have to work hard at making others, your subject collaborate with you in a cooperative kind of game. However, you cannot count on this to be a permanent condition because people are fickle, men change, and from one moment to another, they can stop loving you. And the only defenses that are good, certain, and lasting are those that depend on yourself and on your virtue, where virtue is your, your skills, right? And this is chapter 25th uh, about fortune which is a summary, really, of Renaissance culture. The culture of humanism and the Renaissance is all based on that. God is not in control of your life. That's the natural premise, right? God is not mentioned here. Fortune is not a, a, a term that implies providence, right? Fortune means simply all the external circumstances that an individual, particularly a leader, cannot control. From the time and place where they're born, the skills that nature endowed them with, and other changing circumstances around them. What they can control is, of course, how well they develop their skills, the natural skills they have, and how well they deploy strategies based on those skills and how well they adapt to a changing context or how well they identify the uh, principal qualities of the context of their political game. So, uh, the, one of the basic, the foundational principles of the Renaissance is uh, anyone is responsible, the maker of their own fortune, the maker of their own destiny, right? And this does not mean that, as I said before, anyone is completely in control at any time of the game they play. But they can gain the edge, they can be prepared to uh, remedy what uh, changes, uh, critical changes in the circumstances will happen, okay? So this is a secular ideology, right? Even when you find references to God, uh, they're not significant in a religious way. It is a kind of heroic view of life, right? Life being a constant fight to establish your primacy over the circumstances. And Machiavelli himself has to recognize that the nature of man is such that at some point, perhaps, your skills will not be sufficient to adapt to a new game. And you might fail not because of your individual responsibility, but simply because you, as a leader, are not the answer to the crisis you have in front of you. So either someone else takes your position or you compensate for the lack of skills for the gaps you have by hiring someone like Machiavelli, a select few who uh, can suggest what strategy can be applied to the new crisis that you're facing. 
Let's read from the first paragraph. It is not unknown to me that many, many persons have held and hold the opinion that the things of the world are governed by fortune and by God, meaning by random circumstances or by a creator who governs over everything. In such a manner that men, with their prudence, with their wisdom, cannot correct them, so they're not in control, and instead they have no remedy for them whatsoever, right? And from the point of view of religious culture, this is, of course, a criticism of medieval culture, right? Where the idea is that man is nothing and God is everything, and everything man can achieve is just the positive outcome in a series of trials and tribulations, right? That is the official expression, the official phrase where trials are the temptations that you will encounter and in those experiences you have to demonstrate your loyalty to the rules uh, set by God. And tribulation is instead a reference to suffering, to pain that you will encounter during life that will make you reject God or, or go away from God, stray from the path because you don't, you don't have any hope, any confidence that God is protecting you. But it's basically a, a kind of uh, model where man is inside a golden cage, although the golden cage would have been the Garden of Eden at this point. The cage is not golden or, or silver, it's more like an iron cage. But that is the kind of ideology you find, for example, in one of the, the writings of one of the famous saints of the Middle Ages, St. Francis of Assisi. His writings are limited, but then you, you find a lot of writings by people who were around him, the monks who wrote his biographies, right? That's exactly the idea. Man is nothing. Man has no control. The only strategy is to abandon yourself to providence, right? to consign yourself in the hands of God and hope for the better, because eventually all these trials, tribulation will end. And uh, if, if you have suffered patiently, if you have remained loyal, then you will enjoy the benefits. Sometimes when I think of this, I'm inclined in some part towards their opinion, Machiavelli adds, because keep in mind, Machiavelli has been, we are writing the prince for, for several years between 1512 and 1517 or 18, and things are not going well for Italy altogether. They're going worse. And therefore, there, there is reason to be pessimists. There is reason to think that there will be no solution whatsoever to the issues faced by the Italian states. That is probably too late. And in many ways, it was. Nonetheless, and never discard the relevance of this, nonetheless, because what follows is usually the real thinking by Machiavelli. Nonetheless, so that our free will may not be eliminated, I judge that it may be true that fortune is the arbiter of half of our actions, but even that even she allows us to govern the other half of them. Meaning that, in general, we're not controlled by the circumstances. We're not in control of the circumstances. In general, this is a universal statement. In particular, within each context, you can work at gaining the advantage over fortune. So in general, you're not in control. So in general may mean throughout the life of the leader. But within a specific context, within any specific context, the balance can be upset. And that's the essence of the prince, really. And in some ways, the essence of the culture of the Renaissance. And here you find a famous simile by Machiavelli, whereby fortune is like a river. And when you read this passage, think of Florence. Florence is, uh, has a, a river cutting through it, the Arno River. And the Arno River was then, as well as now, famous for its powerful floods. The most powerful in recent times, of course, happened in 
1966, I think it was November 1966, when the Arno River invaded most of downtown Florence, right? When I was a student at the University of Florence, uh, the university library developed, I think, five floors under uh, the, the ground floor. And I did myself have, in a couple of instances, the experience of requesting an item from the library and being delivered a box with pieces of paper, pages attached to one another because those were flooded books that couldn't be saved, that couldn't be restored, right? And the same was true for works of art, uh, etc. It was a disastrous flood. And uh, famously, a lot of American young people came to Florence to help shovel all the mud that was left after the waters withdrew and, and the debris, okay? And, and they were called the angels of Florence, those American uh, people. It was kind of a first manifestation of the uh, young revolutions of 1968 and 69, right? Uh, young people making a difference. I liken her fortune to one of these ruinous rivers that when they became, become angry, flood the plains, ruin the trees and the buildings, and lift earth <coughs> from one side and place it on the other. Believe me, there was a lot of mud in Florence after 1966. Each person flees before them. Everyone surrenders to their attack without being able, under these circumstances, to block them at any point. Although they really happen this way, it does not follow from this that men, when there are quiet times, are not able to make provisions for them with both dikes and embankments. And this was tried in the area of Florence and along the uh, trajectory of the Arno River for quite some time, but to this day, even now, almost every year there is a point where the water reaches the level uh, of uh, the road in downtown Italy, and, and we've been lucky so far that a similar flood has not happened, but current provisions are not able to really remedy this entirely so that if later the rivers rise, these would either go into a canal or their onslaught would be neither so boundless nor so harmful. So Machiavelli is saying you have, as I said before, you have to recognize that a potential crisis exists, is looming, and apply the remedies when you still have control, not when the crisis explodes in front of you, right? She, fortune, shows her power where virtue is not prepared to resist her, and she turns a rushing current here where she knows that embankments and dikes have not been made to hold her, right? Very famous representation of fortune. And then Machiavelli goes on into a paragraph that demonstrate another team theme that I mentioned in my introduction last week, the ambivalence, the impossibility of assigning a positive or a negative value to any practice or any quality related <coughs> to leadership, because it all depends on the context, right? So it's talking about um, leaders, and they can proceed differently, one with caution, another with impetuosity, one with violence, another with art, influence, one with patience, another with its opposite, and each one in these different manners is able to arrive there, is able to succeed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I'm looking for the passage where it explains, there it is. This arises from nothing but the quality of the times, meaning it all depends on the context, on the time and the place where those qualities, those practices are deployed. And the successful interaction between those strategies and the context will determine whether those qualities were good or bad. Sometimes, some contexts require impetuosity, other patience, etc., etc. Some require force, other require more influence, and so on. However, Machiavelli has to acknowledge in the following page that sometimes leaders are not able to adapt and they just do what's in their nature. 
or they just do what has been good for them in the past. If the times and circumstances change, he, the leader, is ruined because he does not change his manner of proceeding, nor is a man to be found who is so prudent that he knows how to accommodate himself to this, both because he cannot deviate from that toward which nature inclines, right? And moreover, because when a man has always prospered by walking in one path, he cannot be persuaded to depart from it, which is what you see, for example, in a lot of uh, commercial leaders, right? Uh, leaders of, of big companies. Their inability to deviate from what made them successful and continuing without adapting to new circumstances. Think of the inability of big companies such as Microsoft or Apple or even Google to adapt and change. And if Metaverse is the change for Facebook, don't buy any stocks. <laughs> I conclude therefore, and this is another famous passage, where Machiavelli compares fortune to a woman, and as the footnote will tell you, this is based on the allegory of fortune as a woman, meaning fortune, fortuna, both in Latin and Italian is a feminine word. Uh, words have gender, their grammar gender is not related to gender in general, but it so happens that fortuna is feminine, therefore the allegorical representations of fortune, both in ancient times and during the Renaissance, where fortune as, as a woman, and then Machiavelli will say something that can be read as profoundly misogynistic, saying, since fortune is a woman, the best approach is to beat her and to gain control of her. However, you have to look past the misogyny and understand why the formula is built this way. And the best way to explain it, of course, we don't have an, ultimately an explanation for that. My suggestion is that in order to understand this best, you have to look at the genre of the novella, particularly successful during Machiavelli's time, and especially popular within Tuscany and in Tuscan literature. And in the novellas, in the Tuscan novellas, you find a lot of plots based on the interaction and the opposition between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife especially, or a husband and, or, or a wife and their lovers. And within these novellas, the constant is that influence, to go back to the Machiavellian system, will be the strategy deployed by the women. Women are manipulative in these novellas. And men who are not good enough at this kind of manipulative game will resort eventually in a number of these novellas to force and will actually sometimes beat up their wives as a vendetta or as a punishment, etc. So beyond the obvious misogyny, you have to understand that this is yet another way to talk about force and influence, okay? And if fortune is a lady, then the obvious consequence is that fortune is best at using influence and the only remedy is to apply force to that kind of situation. I will not read anything from the last chapter. I will just summarize it in a minute because I'm almost out of time. The last chapter in some ways is the most poetic and the most hypocritical. Machiavelli has to say at the end that the aristocrat, the member of the, of the Medici family, Lorenzo di Piero de' Medici, to whom he dedicated the whole book, can be the savior of Italy. No one would have believed that. He failed when he was the leader of Florence. He failed when he was the leader of Urbino because at some point he left Florence because he couldn't deal with the internal issues and asked for the duchy of Urbino and uh, his, uh, the, the, the Pope who had some authority over Urbino was himself a member of the family, one of the Medici's, Leo X, and so he granted that, but 
again, certainly Lorenzo Di Piero de Medici was not the answer to the crisis of Italy, but Machiavelli had to play this game because ultimately he needed the money. He needed someone to say, oh, thank you, thank you so much for celebrating my skills. Here, uh, 500 ducats to print this book uh, and uh, make you famous, right? This is one thing, the hypocrisy is clear. Machiavelli being pragmatic, he knows his line through his teeth. <laughs> the other part, the poetic part, is this plea to save Italy and this you know, literary trope of Italy herself asking to be saved, calling for the intervention of a powerful leader to save her. And this has been interpreted traditionally as Machiavelli abandoning, finally, logic and reasoning and just using eloquence in the form of this dramatic or poetic structure to encourage readers to take action and do something. And some of that was found in uh, the, 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 at the end, the conclusion of the previous chapter, chapter 25, where Machiavelli says, in the end, acting, doing something is better than doing nothing. It doesn't matter what you do, but doing nothing certainly will not solve any problems, okay? So let me just repeat what I said in front of a small crowd at the beginning of this class. I have published, made all the videos for the lectures of this class public. If you go to the announcement, you can find my channel, which otherwise is very easy, is Dr. Andrea Fedi SBU, I think, or Andrea Fedi SBU. By making those videos public, you can use the search feature on YouTube to search for a topic that you want to review uh, before the exam, the introduction to a film, or uh, uh, the, the, the analysis of a chapter or a group of chapters. I will not have class on Friday, I will post an announcement to that effect and change the calendar. Of course, I'll be with you with the presentations and feel free also to email me or use the same scheduling app. You can also do that since we have it, to schedule an appointment not to present, but rather to discuss the draft of your paper or uh, the structure of your presentation before you actually do the presentation. So, Feel free to use calendly.com slash Andrea Fedi for any kind of appointment to see me before the presentation, before the exam, or to present, okay?